Welcome back, everybody. We're about to get into scene one of Act Two. Um, Act Two in all of Macbeth, not Macbeth, Shakespeare's plays uh, uh, is the rising action. So first we have the exposition, and then we have the rising action. If you look at Freytag's Pyramid, um, in scene one here we have Banquo and Fleance, who is Banquo's son, and they have a torch because it is very late at night. Banquo says to his son Fleance, "How goes the night, boy?" The moon is down, I have not heard the clock. And she goes down at 12. I take tis later, sir. So they're basically just talking about the time here. And usually the clock goes off at 12, but it's later than that and it still hasn't gone off. So right off the bat, we see that something peculiar um, is things are out of sorts, so to speak. Banquo says, hold, take my sword. He gives his sword to Fleance. Um, why would a, a parent give their son a weapon? Um, it tells us a little bit about Banquo's trepidation here and his suspicion or his gut feelings that things are not as they should be. Um, he gives him his sword saying, there's husbandry in heaven. Their candles are all out. Take thee that too. A heavy summons lies like lead upon me. And yet I would not sleep. Merciful powers restrain in me the cursed thoughts that nature gives way to in repose. So Banquo is commenting on the fact that he cannot sleep, right? There's husbandry in heaven. Their candles are all out. It's peculiar that all of the lights are out at this moment. Um, a heavy summons lies like lead upon me, and yet I would not sleep. He's having difficulty sleeping despite the fact that he's tired, okay? Also, I wanted to point out that this is where I chose your vocab word, right? Repose means to, to lie down or to sleep. So now enter Macbeth and a servant with a torch. Banquo, hearing Macbeth approach, says, give me my sword. Who's there? Presumably, uh, you know, he's a little bit nervous and this noise startles him a bit. A friend, Macbeth says. What, sir? Not yet at rest? The king's abed. He hath been unusual in unusual pleasure and sent forth great largesse to your offices. This diamond he greets your wife withal. By the name of most kind hostess and shut up in measureless content. So the king apparently commented to Banquo saying how he's been treated um, exceptionally well. And so he gifts Lady Macbeth with a diamond, right? This is the largest that he is um, giving to the Macbeths. So we can just imagine how effective Lady Macbeth's butt kissing is since the since Duncan the King is so happy. Um, he hands over Macbeth the jewel that is meant for Lady Macbeth. And now Macbeth says, being unprepared, our will became the servant to defect, which else should free have brought. All's well. I dreamt last night of the three weird sisters. To you, they have showed some truth. Macbeth says, I think not of them. Yet when we can entreat an hour to serve, we would spend it in some words upon that business, if you would grant the time. So Banquo is telling Macbeth that he's been thinking about these three weird sisters. And Macbeth responds saying, I think not of them. Right? Is that true? Or has Macbeth been thinking about the prophecy? Um, he's lying here. He's been thinking a whole lot about the prophecy because he wants to become king, right? So then he goes on and he says, yet we can entreat an hour to serve. We would spend it in some words upon that business. He says, at a later time, when you have some time, let's sit down and chat about this. And Banquo says, at your kindest leisure, Macbeth now, if you shall cleave to my consent, when tis, it shall make honor for you. Reread this here. If you shall cleave to my consent, when tis, it shall make honor for you. Now, if you look in your book, cleave means adhere, consent means advice. So if you shall adhere to my advice when tis, it shall make honor for you. What is Macbeth 
saying to Banquo. Banquo responds saying, so I lose none in seeking to augment it, but still keep my bosom franchise and allegiance clear. I shall be counseled. This is a very important response. What is Banquo's response to Macbeth here? And I just lost my page. As long as, so so means as long as, franchise means free of guilt and allegiance clear means pure. I shall be counseled. So what's his response? Ultimately, he's saying, I'll listen to whatever you have to say so long as I don't gain a guilty conscience because of, because of what you want to require me to do. So Banquo is, I think, a little bit suspicious of Macbeth's intentions here. Um, he's kind of asserting the fact that he is not going to get involved and do any dirty work. Macbeth says, good, repose the while. Once again, vocabulary word. Take, you know, rest for a little while. Banquo says, thanks, sir, so like to you. Banquo and Fleance now exit, and Macbeth is seen here alone, yet he's got a lot of lines here. So this, as you already know, is a soliloquy. He's going to be thinking out loud. He says to his servant, go bid thy mistress when my drink is ready. She strike upon the bell, get thee to bed. And here we have the beginning of the soliloquy. I used to have my students read this aloud on the auditorium stage, which we cannot do, obviously. So Macbeth says, is this a dagger which I see before me, the handle towards my hand? Come, let me clutch thee. I have thee not, and yet I see thee still. So he's, what is he doing here? I, I don't, before I give it to you, um, he's musing that there's something before him. What is it? A dagger. And then he says, come, let me clutch thee. So you, could put, you can imagine that he's reaching out to clutch this dagger that he is hallucinating in front of him. I have thee not, and yet I see thee still. Art thou not fatal vision, sensible to feelings as to sight? Or art thou but a dagger of the mind, a false creation proceeding from the heat oppressed brain? So heat oppressed brain, he's talking about his brain and how it's been um, fevered with all of the things that he's thinking, right? So he's saying, is this a hallucination of the mind proceeding from my brain, which has been getting a lot of like overwork right now, it's being overworked. I see thee yet in form as palpable as this, which now I draw, and he draw, draws his own dagger. So now he's holding his real dagger, but he can see a hallucination of one in front of him. Thou marshalest me the way that I was going, and such an instrument I was to use. Mine own eyes are made the fools of other senses, or else worth all the rest. I see thee still, and on thy blade and dungeon gouts of blood which was not so before there's no such thing it is the bloody business which informs thus to mine eyes now over the one half world nature seems dead wicked dreams abuse the curtain sleep witchcraft celebrates celebrates pale hecate's offering hecate is the um the goddess of witches okay so she's kind of like the leader we're going to see more about her later but he kind of is mentioning here, um, witchcraft is celebrating pale Hecate's offerings and withered murdered, alarmed by his sentinel, which is a guard, the wolf, whose howls his watch thus with the stealthy pace, with Tarkin's ravishing strides towards his design, moves like a ghost. Thou sure and firm set earth, hear not my steps which way they walk for fear the very stones prate of my whereabouts and take the present horror from the time which now suits with it. Whilst I threat, he lives. Words to the heat of deeds too cold breath gives. And now a bell would chime. Okay, so it would probably be like a, a, an ominous bell, not a, you know, a cheerful little ringing. Okay, this is like an ominous death knell. I go and it is done. The bell invites me. Hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. 
And obviously we have here a rhyme. This is what we call rhyming couplet. Shakespeare often does this to indicate the end of a scene. And that is the end of scene two. I'll check you guys later.